Kia ora guys, Kepa Mewitt here back on the Raw HQ podcast and today we sit down with a very decorated sports person, uh, someone with a very successful uh, career thus far, uh, somebody that attended the Olympics, uh, the Commonwealth Games on multiple occasions and somebody that uh, I think a lot of the New Zealand public sort of look up to and that is Sarah Cowley-Ross. So we had a little chat about her background obviously, how she got into athletics, how she made her way to the Olympics and and uh, a few sort of little stumbling blocks along the way, which was really interesting for me to hear about and also hear about how she planned and put in place a bit of a process for her to follow in order to uh, make it to the Olympics and nail down her dreams that she'd had for uh, such a long time. So I think you guys will really get a lot out of this chat. I hope you do. I hope you get as much out of it as I did. And uh, make sure you grab yourself a good buzz kombucha the sponsor of this podcast very good drink uh, sit back relax and enjoy this little chat with sarah Kelly ross olympian kia ora guys uh, kevin Mute here raw hq and today we've got a special guest uh sarah Kelly ross she's uh an Olympian um, and some really she's got some really cool um, sort of credentials I suppose in athletics and I, ha- I had a little look through and seen uh, what you're up to these days and also um, had a bit of a look back through your timeline and sort of got a bit of an understanding of um, everything that you've done so far so very excited to chat to you mate thanks for coming in Oh, thanks for having me. It's so nice to be in the studio yeah. and in the really cool studio and at Raw Fitness. Yeah, yeah thanks, mate. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so I think what we'll do to start off with is just get um, a bit of a context uh, of your background. And um, I know you're a you're a Bay girl and and from Rotorua, and I want to get an understanding of what your I guess your childhood was like. So tell me about. Your family and, and your background um, over the over there in Rotorua. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm love being in the bay, yeah. the real bay. Let's mm. get that right. Yeah, first. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I guess proudly grew up in Rotorua. Uh, I had such an awesome childhood there because it was uh, very free and just we were kids, you know, playing lots and. I'm in the middle of two boys, so my older brother Gaz and my younger brother Richie. Um, we had we did lots of different sports. We had the backyard was where we tried it all, mm. uh, and no matter what it was, it was like either go home, stay home, or one on one basketball, or two on one, or mm. my dad would play, or my mum would play, and it was just really active, uh, fun natural Kiwi kid um, childhood I, I would I think yeah 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 that <laughs> yeah. no, sounds sounds pretty typical of a Kiwi upbringing I guess so yeah. uh, are both your parents Samoan or is it one yeah, side so, of Samoan or? Um, so my dad was Samoan he mm. sadly passed away when I was 19 and my mum she's Kiwi uh, yeah so my mum's dad came to New Zealand when he was seven years old from Sunderland in the UK, oh, okay. and my dad came to New Zealand when he was seven from Samoa. Ah, so, right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, very cool. So yeah, quite quite a cool like everyone's everyone's immigrants here in some sense, mm. and it's just the pathway that I guess my ancestors, my English ancestors, and also my Samoan ancestors have navigated to Aotearoa yeah. to provide us with this. Well, for me, it was um, to get to the point where I had this amazing childhood, mm. uh, growing up in a in a stable home with a mum and dad uh, who loved us, who nurtured us. We had grass to play on. We had mm. a basketball hoop. We had a ball to throw through the basketball hoop, and we had opportunities that not every New Zealand child gets today. Right, right. Um, why did they? Why did your mum and your dad move to Rotorua or, or their parents or yeah, how did they come good, to be in Rotorua? Yeah. yeah, so I, I think it was around um, my mum. She trained as a journalist and okay. my my dad grew up in Tokoroa. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, so and my, my parents met in Auckland. My mum grew up in Auckland yep. and my mum got a job at 
the Daily Post okay. in Rotorua. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe it was the Rotorua Review first. Mm -hmm. And my dad, he was uh, worked in insurance and he sort of had a job between Tukaroa and Rotorua at, at the start and then he had a pra like financial services um, practice oh, okay. uh, in Rotorua. Right, I see. Yeah, so we, yeah, I, we, they just, their work, I think, mm. made us grow up yeah, yeah, <laughs> in yeah, Rotorua, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good question though. No, no, no. Oh, that's cool. Um, okay, so tell me a little bit more about um, sports as a kid. Yeah. Um, I, I assume, like, I mean, if you're a hip athlete, I, obviously you've got to be pretty good at and pretty well rounded sort of athlete. So, did you have uh, quite a, a broad sort of base of different sports when you were yeah. growing up? Yeah, yeah. I did. I yeah. did. And so, uh, I th I'm not sure when I started playing like organized sport as such, but I remember like going to gymnastics, going, like trying gymnastics. I also did like ballet, mm. um, which, you know, is a, you know, when you think about now conditioning and things mm. like that, really, I did it for quite a few, um, you know, maybe four years as a kid. Mm. Um, we did things like golf, you know, we, I played tennis for a time. So it was, we did, a really a broad range of sports mm. but I guess um, I my brothers and I we sort of it was in the old in the old days but back in that sort of mode where you played a winter sport and then you played a summer mm. sport and it was very clear the seasons and so my brothers played cricket and rugby and I did athletics and netball right okay and then I why, why athletics well my fr a friend of mine was really a childhood friend was really good at athletics mm. and she sort of invited me along to come with her mm. and they live sort of across the fence from us and i think for my parents my mum sort of says now like i had gone home and said oh can i go to athletics with mm. Haley heathcote yeah. and she was like can sh can her parents take you <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And mum was like, yeah, sure, you can go. Yeah, um, yeah. And then it kind of grew from there. And on Saturdays, they would have like ribbon days and like uh, the, this uh, centre is like Waikato Bay of Plenty. So it was around mm. the region. Mm. And I would go with her family mainly and go to like ribbon days. Right. And my parents, because my parents were going to two separate cricket grounds to watch my brothers. Mm. So... Th you know, on the odd occasion they could come, which was awesome. Hmm. But I was quite happy to sort of... Still by yourself. Yeah. So how old were you when you started? Oh, uh, I, I guess I was probably 11 maybe right. when I went to like club athletics. Mm. Uh, we, we did athletics at like, you know, like school, school sports, things yeah. like that. And, and that was kind of like really cool for me. But then I kind of wanted a little bit more. So I was lucky that Hayley Heathcote's family took me under their wing. <laughs> yeah, right. Very cool. Okay, so uh, I was just having a look and it looks like in um, year 2000, um, you go to the Oceania Youth um, like athletics for, yeah. uh, what was it, hurdles and yeah. and maybe a high jump? Yeah. So j just in between that time that you started when you're, you know, 10, 11, 12, and the time when you're obviously performing pretty well. What is it that's happened in that little period that made you think I might pursue, you know, some higher honours or um, start to have a real go at, at this um, sport? What mm. w Was there somebody that gave you that sort of feedback that mm. you were quite talented or mm. that you were hardworking or whatever it might be? Yeah. Or was it just something that you were just really passionate about yourself? Yeah. So when I went to high school, I I went to the school athletics day and did reasonably okay. Mm. But one of the teachers there, who was a PE teacher, Morag Owen, uh, she went to the 1990 Commonwealth Games as a sprinter. Okay. And so I was like really fortunate. Um, because she was a teacher at my school mm. and she off the back of the athletics day invited a couple of us including like one of my best friends to come along and do some winter training for mm. athletics mm -hmm. and so from there she became my our, my coach and it just grew and grew and grew so mm. you know I remember first year 
at high school as like a third former going to the national secondary school athletics competition and getting like dead last in high jump mm. and then a year later getting third right and then it was like gold and so forth so right. uh, it was just like I didn't train I guess it was hard work but it wasn't like we trained two times a week in winter but then we we're doing netball as well mm. so and that became more and then I gave away netball and like towards the end of sixth form when I started to make New Zealand teams and things like that because I couldn't I just couldn't do I couldn't mm. be at the netball practice, say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was just, yeah, I think that was the last year I would, would have played, like, reps for netball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so what took your interest, like, what, what did you take an interest in, in athletics, like, initially, when you start to make these, um, you know, teams and that sort of thing? What, what were the particular events that you were interested in at the beginning? Yeah, so hurdles and high jump was really okay. my thing. Right. Uh, and, like, I went, in 2000, went to... Uh, Pacific School Games, which mm -hmm. in 2000, it was kind of like the test event for the Sydney Olympics. So it was okay. this incredible experience yeah. of like Pacific Rim countries. And in Sydney, and, you know, we got to go in the Olympic Stadium. Yeah, awesome. And, yeah, it was pretty cool as a 16-year-old kid from yeah. Rotorua yeah. um, to be like, oh, wow, this is like, well, this is really cool. Yeah. And so I ended up getting third in the hurdles there. Mm. And that sort of like, you know, you have a little bit of success and then you want, well, if you're third, then what do you aim for? Yeah, yeah. You know? And if you go to one, if you make one New Zealand team, well, how do you make the next one? For sure. And and so it was that sort of little bit of success but also really motivated for more mm. that, that kept me going. Yeah, that mm. progress is sort of addictive, isn't it? It absolutely is. Yeah. <laughs> so when did you sit down and think – you know, I assume when you've gone away to Sydney and you get to try all, all like the flash new stadium and uh, that kind of thing. So when did you sort of sit down and nut out some goals either individually or with a coach or with your parents or whoever it might be? When did you start to put together a bit of a list that you want to check off? Or um, did you have a process for how you wanted to, I assume, make it to the Olympics or um, whatever your goals might have been? I knew that was the end goal, say, mm. the Olympics. Mm. And I remember being eight years old and watching the Olympics and thinking, that's what I want to do. Yeah, right. And then four years later, tw a 12 year old, and I remember uh, sitting at Rotor Intermediate and the class stopped to watch Daniel Loder to like swim those gold medal races. Yeah, yeah. And that was like, oh, yeah, okay. So this like seed just grew and grew and grew mm. but in terms of a, a plan um that came later when i was like it was a bit more realistic that i was had the, the potential say to go to the olympics but in terms of goal setting uh, we as a family set set goals every year is that right yeah oh tell, tell me about yeah. that that's quite so, interesting yeah it, it, so from probably when i was about 10 my dad would sit us down mm. in like the end of January and uh, he'd, he'd be like, right, let's write our goals for the year. Awesome. And uh, so it was like sporting goals mm. and it was like at school as well. And I guess for the first few years it was because we were 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like, I don't know, maybe try better or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then it was like, okay, well, let's get a bit specific about it. Let's mm, put timelines right. on it right. and things like that. So in that regard, it was amazing yeah. that, that my parents were into goal setting yeah. for, our, for us as kids mm. from a young yeah. age. And it wasn't like – and if you, like, handed them back to, like <laughs> – my parents and they weren't like up to like up to scratch. Yeah, up to scratch. Redo it was like it. Re redo it. Yeah, right. You know, like they were stretching us at a young yeah. age because they they knew that we could handle it, mm. uh, and also they instilled like a work ethic and self belief in us. Mm. So it wasn't like an option of just try better. It was mm. like, well, how are you going to try better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So in terms of like goal setting that's been ingrained in me from a very young age yeah that's really yeah. interesting eh? yeah 
That's pretty cool from uh, from your parents. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah it's, effort. it's really effort when I like now as a parent. Yeah, I look yeah. back and go, oh wow, that was pretty hard out, but actually really cool. Yeah, really yeah. cool. It'd be pretty funny if you went back and seen your goals when you're ten or eleven oh, and said Olympics on it or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think, like, from an overall plan perspective, like, when did I plan to go to the Olympics? Well, I guess in 2005, I changed to heptathlon and, and mm. went to the Commonwealth Games the following year. And that was kind of like, okay, well, the next progression is World Championships and Olympics. Mm. But I missed 2008. So then it was like, okay, well, how am I going to get to 2012 mm. and make sure that it happens? So when did you... Uh, go away from you know strictly hurdles or um, high jump and, the, and go into like the heptathlon sort of arena. When what year was it that you started to focus more on that? Two thousand and two. Uh, in terms of goals, I really wanted to go to World Juniors, mm. uh, and I thought maybe my best opportunity was actually in heptathlon. Mm -hmm. So I did. Uh, so the standards, like the individual standards, were a bit out of my reach, but actually. People had sort of been telling me you'd be good at heptathlon, but I was like, oh, I'm not really sure. I, I'm mm. not that good at throwing. I'm not a natural thrower. Mm. Is that uh, what you struggled with the most? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, it's really weird because I grew up with brothers who like threw cricket balls and things like that. So like javelin, like having an, a good whip and like mm. just getting the timing right. It just didn't come naturally to me. Mm. Um, that's a whole other thing. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, in terms of when I progressed to the heptathlon, uh, I had a little dabble in 2002 to try and go to World Juniors, but I ended up getting injured really badly. Well, oh, I had really? Mul um, d stress fractures in both my naviculars, had to get them operated on, had really? them pinned, both pinned. And so when I came back um, following like that, uh, injury and surgery and rehab I just did long jump mm. because I thought even though it's still a lot of stress on your body yeah. uh, I was like okay well multi like just single plane uh, I can one foot was really good one required another surgery on it right. so I was like oh well, I can jump off this foot it's good and uh, what event was it that do you think was causing the most issues with your feet I think it was actually not such an event it was I went from training in Rotorua on a grass track to I went to university um I was at physio school ironically mm. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I went on to a like a, a, a record hand track so like a, a proper athletics track and the change of intensity I was it's generally right. a change okay. or a re or a biomechanical fault over long yeah. time. Yeah. Um, I have got quite pigeon-toed feet, mm. but I think it was more the, the change. Yeah. Does it yeah. cause you any issues anymore? No. My feet have caused me issues oh, probably. Whole yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So okay. I remember like <clears throat> in 2012, I sort of hurt my ankle and had to go get a scan at in Switzerland, we were in Switzerland at the time, and the guy was like looking at the MRI, going like, it, 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 "Well, this is not where the pain is." Like, <laughs> and I was like, "Don't worry about that. Like, it's <laughs> yeah. fine." Because it, it was kind of like it was just a, it's just a load management right. um, for my feet. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, I've done a lot of work on foot conditioning. Right. Uh, for my feet, but also for a performance kind of. Sure. Yeah. Because if you think about like, well, where does all the load come through first? Mm. Where do you get, where do you get that, where do you, where does it go, leave mm. as well? It's your feet. Mm. And so if you can get that a stable and um, good springs, mm. then that, that transfers. Yeah. yeah, but I've had to really look after my feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but well, it's, it's like obviously all the sports that you're involved in are so like, plyometric, like focus, so dynamic, and there's about as much stress as you can put through your feet. So <laughs> you've got to yeah. look after yeah. them a fair bit. Um, okay, so tell me um, a little bit about um, the 06 Com Games. Mm -hmm. So this is only you only have tackle on that. That's the only thing yeah. you're competing in by yep. that stage, eh? Yeah. So, um, yeah, tell me about that experience. It's your, your first one, I guess, and um, first, well, 
I guess it's a pretty major sort of a competition. So yeah. what was that experience like? It was, it was awesome. Cause yeah. it was, it, so, so in 05 was like, I came back for my first international competition after kind of like my feet injury, mm. my foot injury. And I went to World Uni Games in mm. Turkey. And I roomed with an hip, a heptathlete. Right. And like I was doing long jump and she was doing heptathlon. And I was and I was like, man, this is like, I've come halfway around the world and I'm doing like six jumps and then I'm going back. Yeah, and I'm right. like, man, I, I was like, I feel like this would be the real time to transition. Mm -hmm. So came home, um, told my coach, we're, we're doing heptathlon now. I want to go to the Commonwealth Games, qualified. And the whole experience for me, like, was really cool because my a lot of my family could go there because mm. it was in Melbourne. Uh, I had cousins there that I'd never met before. Sure. Uh, so it was really cool. And, like, I did no, three no throws in Javelin. Mm. So that was – I was really new to the event, uh, you know, in front of this big MCG crowd. It was, like, awful, mm. that experience of doing three no throws. But being part of the New Zealand team, being part of the, like my first essentially New Zealand senior team mm. was, yeah, really special. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So what happens over the next couple of years, I guess you're starting to build up for um, the 08 Olympics. So tell me about um, the lead up to that and then um, I guess what happened over those next couple of years. Yeah, so basically over the next five years really, I slogged my guts out, mm. uh, trained really well, but just couldn't put it together right. when, it, when it came to competition time. And mm -hmm. I had uh, one heptathlon in particular leading into 08 where I was on for a really, really good score. Mm. Uh, and then did three no long jump, three thousand long jump. So it's like mm. zero points mm. and you should be getting like – could potentially get about a thousand points in long jump. Yeah. So it was, yeah, heartbreaking. All those like, because I was pretty much I was working part time as a physio, mm. but I was really just really training. Mm. And uh, during that time, it was like I was sort of like determined that it was going to come right at mm. competition time, but mm. it never did. Uh, what do you think it was? I it was just purely mental, right? Eh? I I could do the physical work, but I hadn't done really done the mental work, yeah. and so it was like a combination of factors. But really, I needed to like strip down myself, uh, get really clear on who I was as a person, mm -hmm. and I think I'd just kind of gone into autopilot mode a bit. Um, but, yeah, it was, yeah, in 2011 I made some significant changes, and that was kind of like the catalyst for change for yeah. me. Yeah, and it was, yeah, like a really, when I look back at that five-year period where I only improved 50-odd points, so like 2%, and that's like, that's shit. Mm. Like it was for the effort that I was putting in. That's it what was I was going like, to say. Yeah. So for, you know, like you say, to, to, to slog away for five years and then get a 2% increase, how did you, what were these changes that you made? Um, I mean, I assume that you start to uh, work a little bit harder on your mental game and um, and then, like you say, um, so, sort of figure yourself out and, and that kind of thing. So, what were these? What were these changes that you made that had had the big impact on you? Because yeah. obviously, when you go away to the Olympic Games, you've done a really, really awesome job just to get there. Yeah. Um, so, tell me about that. Yeah. So, I think first of all, it was like just drawing a line in the sand and accepting, hey, like I can't carry on like this. I can't keep like beating myself up over mm. um, not not being able to show up when I really when I needed to show up, and so mm. I, I became a victim of my own self sabotage in that regard. Um, so first of all, got a new sports psych who I just immediately gelled with, who mm. pushed the right buttons for me, and really our goal was self acceptance. It wasn't about performance or anything. Yeah. He was like um, almost like I want you to be injured. 
uh, <laughs> to really push you. And I was like, what? <laughs> and yeah, I always remember him being like, well, I, I actually want you to do your hamstring at the, at the last Olympic trial possibility to really know who you are. To really know. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I got it. Like I understood what he was talking about. And um, so that was really awesome, mm. really freeing for me. Mm. Like I felt like I'd been carrying a lot of weight. Um, and I don't know whether that was part of that was maybe grief from my dad mm. um, and other factors. Um, but I felt really freed in this hard work that I had to do on myself mm. and that just kind of let let go on the track but the other changes that I made I had um I was really fortunate to have a really good coach um Elena Brown and we we brought on my who's now my now husband mm. um into the team into the fold he wasn't <coughs> my husband then yep. um <laughs> And he looked after my strength and conditioning and my physiology. He's a power physiologist yeah. by trade, and mm. and that was a that was a massive thing. Yeah. Um, not only the work, but um, I guess his support. And we weren't in a relationship then, but um, obviously we got on well. And uh, I think that was a, a really good edge. And he was in Dunedin at that time, and so I was he was writing my my program. Um, my like weights program and uh, I had a guy called Mike McGugan who was delivering it in Auckland for me mm. and I guess my mindset changed and I was free to be an athlete free to like really go for it and I think I'd kind of been on this autopilot mode of like sure. doing the mahi and then actually going actually why are we doing this and it was right. just like a sense of urgency where every session I, I knew that this was it like this is it if you ain't <laughs> making this you ain't you know like yeah. and I knew that all this investment not only myself my whanau my friends um this was it and so this urgency of every rep counted every day counted every sleep counted every food decision counted mm. um my team were just so on board with that and it was right. just like this really awesome experience. Did you feel like, because um, I guess there's, there's sort of two two ways you can treat that sort of situation. I know that some people might think of it as a lot of pressure being on yourself, you know, like so you're putting a lot of pressure on you when you say that like, you're representing all of these people and like every single meal counts and that kind of thing. So that can be like a really good driving factor and it can also, on a, from a, I don't know, playing the devil's advocate, it could yeah. also make you think like, oh, it's my last chance, I, I might m mess this up, you know. So did you feel that pressure or did you feel sort of um, liberated in the way that yeah. your mental skills coach, or, mm. you know, w was treating the situation? Yeah, so I think for a long time I felt that, that what you describe as the weight of the pressure. Mm. But then it was like during this time period for me, uh, it was like – a liberation mm. where that pressure was actually a privilege right, right and it was a real turning point for me mm. to be like oh this is this is such i'm so grateful mm. to have this uh to have the support rather than the weight yeah. of these people well it seems like you, you plugged a lot of the leaks that were happening in terms of your um, athletic life and we'll touch on the the London stuff in a moment but what I want to talk about uh, first of all is you talk about um, that big grind that you're in for that past five years like leading up to this um, big event so tell me about um, what your training week was like in that period of time mm. when you're trying to train for like multiple events right so how does it how does your how's your day split up and then how is your training allocated you know between those different events I, I don't know if you like concentrate more on your strengths or if you try and fix up your weaknesses like with your throwing or, or whatever it is so tell me a little bit about the training side of it I'm quite interested in it yeah so fortunately I didn't have to like worry about like mapping that out like yeah, my coach 100%. and my team did so sure. that was great yeah. uh, but in terms of I guess how a normal week would look we would train like Monday through Saturday morning Mm -hmm. would be like the last session 
I would have a massage at like one, 12 o'clock on Saturday, like my second massage of the week, mm. and that would be it. And mm-hmm. I would not be able to get out of bed on Sunday yeah, yeah. and then just do it all again. <laughs> <laughs> Sucker. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so it's probably trained about 20 to 25 hours, just pure training. Wow. But then on top of that, you know, I was really – to be able to handle that load, uh, I would do a couple of phys- um, Pilates sessions a week. I had an awesome Pilates instructor, Ray Wen Hing. Mm. Uh, I would maybe do like one yoga session and I would have multiple physio, massage, chiro if I needed mm. um, to get me through. Um, and the week was sort of structured like uh, we would work on strengths uh but at the same time if i let my throws drop too much it was like would really hurt me because every Mm. event's like judged on points Mm. uh so you want to obviously maximize the points in the events and it's it was easier for me to get more points with my hurdles and high jump background in those Mm. first events but so how we did it would be like javelin for example i would need to feel the jab Mm. uh four times a week so two maybe like in my warm-up i'd do just do roll my shoulder over like for 15 minutes beforehand maybe two to three times a week and then do two javelin sessions Mm. as well right so it was more like javelin in particular for me was something which i kind of had this battle with and like <laughs> I had to like really learn to, for the javelin and I think part of that was the 2006 Commonwealth Games like still like yeah, lingering like, yeah. uh, but honestly when you throw a jab and you hit it it's like such great feeling yeah, right. so it's like even though it was difficult for me it was a real sense of like accomplishment when in London I actually well, when I, in my qualifying heptathlon for London, threw a PB then. Right. And then in London, threw a PB in the Olympic Games. Awesome. So I started out throwing 22 metres and mm. finished with like 41.93. So. Well. Wow. Yeah. So it's it, that improvement and those goals and, you know, going back to that, yeah. that process of, and doing the mahi. Mm. But then I think it became a step more than that. It's like, I'm not just going to improve if I just keep throwing and bashing my arm it's kind of like I had to feel it and Mm. have this kind of bonding with my javelins Um, but going back to your question of what Mm -hmm. my training week looked like uh, it I I usually did about three big weight sessions so and that was obviously to condition myself to be able to handle the load mm. to to be strong enough to throw shot to mm. be strong enough to take uh like loads and high jump around a bend that you can sort of get up to like 20 times your body weight force through your your body so mm. it's significant and you need to be in shape to be able to handle that sure. and jump high um but i would do Two hurdle sessions a week, one long jump, one high jump, one shot, a couple of javelins, um, and about three to four running sessions, and that would include hurdles. So mm. uh, that was some days were double days, some days were just like a really long afternoon, um, <laughs> <laughs> evening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I would, you know, as a multi-eventer, you're like first to the track and you're last yeah, to leave right. because you've got such a big you've got stuff like to do. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess, and it's technical. So it's really sure. it's technical, and the only way that's great because you can, like, you know, that Unload ten thousand hours, you yeah. know, but you still need the high intensity stuff. And mm. my coach, we ran a lot, so. Uh, made you tired and (laughs) but it also it also i I enjoyed that type of training Mm. the suffering right (laughs) yeah that's pretty sick (laughs) yeah so uh okay so in 2011 you were saying how you made a few changes what did your goal setting process look like from then leading up into the 2012 um, olympics so what what did you 
how did you go about setting these goals? Yep. Um, I feel like it's going to be a little bit different than what I expect yeah. talking about um, your mental skills sort of yep. work. So, yeah, yeah how, did, how, how did that come about? Okay, so performance-wise, uh, it was very. this is very easy for me to answer. I had a, a wall planner on my wall and on the top I needed to score 6,050 points. Mm. So I had like a combination of performances to get to that mm. so hurdles was like 1390 seconds high jump 185 shot put 1290 and every event had a target right. and then below it it had the a standard which was 6150 points and so that was like another option mm. and then every day on this calendar mm. which came all around the world with me on mm. that day and i would have traveled to a lot of countries within that year, um, it was a breakdown of, okay, well, what does a 1390 hurdler look like? What does a 182 high jump look high jumper look like? Mm. So what do I have to run for 60 meters, maybe, um, on my coach's watch? I can't remember my 60 time, but what if I have to what do I have to run for a K in reps? So mm. probably I'm gonna have to run 310 for a couple of reps mm. um, to be able to run a good 800 mm. what do, what do i have to run for 150 what do i have to run for 300 what do i have to clean what do i have to bench what do i have to quarter squat what do i you know mm. so it's really easy in athletics actually to yeah. go super well, objective this is, isn't yeah it? this is what this looks like and mm. i probably hadn't done that breakdown of performance like okay well in long jump if i want to jump 620 what does that look like off mm. six strides? What does that look like off 10 strides? Right. And so, okay, well, you got the six, done. You got the 10, done. Okay, are you running fast enough? Uh, then it's like, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, right. That's so it's, it's quite cool in that regard. Yeah. And my husband is actually really awesome at like, okay, well, how are we going to make this work? Yeah, yeah. That's kind of like one of the things like, okay, well, what – what does your power plate numbers have to look like? What does mm. your drop jump have to look like? Um, what's your vertical jump? Uh, what's your impulse look like? Mm. What angle, what biomechanic things do we need to hit and jab? What, what's your angle at takeoff and long jump? Mm. And, um, you know, you could write a list of all the things, course, but yeah. essentially that's what we did. Yeah, right. So you just yeah. have, you know, like just so everybody at home is getting a little bit of um, – information on this because it, just for um, a bit of transfer to what we do here like we always speak a lot about objective goals and like we try to be performance focused here so it's really interesting and there's some really good um, sort of transfer out of this stuff but uh, for you guys at home just having like a your outcome first of all and then working backwards on that and breaking those got those bigger goals down into um, much smaller goals obviously people in like general population in the gym are not going to have as specific goals as this but it's still the same sort of um principle yeah. when you're working back from a goal and having you know um time sort of um time-based sort of goals around it and then also breaking down those little steps is something that's really really crucial to understand when it comes to goal setting. so this is really yeah really and cool stuff. honestly like I, I i actually think it's the same it's like it doesn't matter it's, if it's the olympics or it's you know, how do you increase your deadlift? Exactly. You know, it's exactly yeah. the same principle. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to go, I think one of the things that you need is how do I stay healthy mm. to achieve that? And that's something Absolutely. that gets a little bit lost in yeah. that. <laughs> um, and how do I have fun along the way? Because yeah. when you're like, rrr, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's really important as mm. well. well that, like, like you were saying, like when you start to get a little bit of success, whether it be like making teams or getting medals or just a five kilo increase on a deadlift, it's again, it's a super addictive feeling and then you start to enjoy the process as opposed to just always focusing on that outcome yeah. goal. And that's yeah. um, that's something that's really important for people to understand as well. Um, okay, so, so now uh, obviously you've hit a lot of these goals and you've made it to the Olympics. Talk us through, well, actually first of all, is this, was the Olympics a highlight of your career? Or what, what was – tell us about the highlight of your athletic career yeah. um, my, thus far because yeah. I know you're still, you're still involved <laughs> in it. Yeah, so my highlight was actually the journey to right. that, um, yeah. to the Olympics mm. because – and we've talked about it today already. It's like 
I was in a really dark place mm. um, in the middle of 2011. Mm. And for me to, I guess, learn how to be myself again and then uh, flourish as an athlete yeah. uh, was huge for me. Course, and yeah. so I think qualifying for the Olympics was actually my highlight. I'm not saying that the Olympics was not a highlight, yeah, but yeah. actually the journey to it, and I know it's cliched, yeah. but it was so much more impactful mm. and so much more empowering for me. Mm. No, that's really cool. Mm. That, that, that makes complete sense, to be honest. And that's, um, yeah, coming back to, like, enjoying the whole process of it and the journey of it and oh. seeing, like, how you grow, not just, obviously, in terms of your numbers yeah. on the board, but... Yeah. Just everything that you get out of that. Um, okay, what was uh, what was 2012 like? Tell me about the Olympics. For me, it was really surreal because mm. I'd wanted it for so long, yeah. and I had yeah, it just was something that was like up here and just like thinking about it so intensely and being so committed to this goal mm. that uh, when I got there and the New Zealand team does such an awesome job of welcoming our athletes into the village and yeah they have you know they have a process of of that and part of that is they'll do a haka mm. and for all the it, it, like a porphyry essentially to yeah. our space in the village and i remember uh coming in and we had we i was based in switzerland that year for like three months before the games and then we went to Cardiff for our training camp beforehand where the athletics team and we came up on a bus to the village uh, for to come into the village and I remember coming into the village and being with my athletics friends who a lot of them we'd, we'd grinded away for many years yeah. together and some had already been to games and, and whatnot but I remember feeling like seeing this haka being done towards to us and the people were like I remember one of my physios and my massage therapist and just how proud they were to hucker us in. Sure. And I remember being like, oh, what? what? I feel like a hay fever. <laughs> 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 and I was like, oh, man, like, why, why, oh my God, why is this a hay fever? <laughs> and it was just like everything flooding back to me mm. in that moment. Yeah, and right. so that was really special. And I think the other special thing about the Olympics, because everything is, is incredible, it's just like, you go to a Commonwealth Games and you're like mind blown, but then you go to the Olympics and it's just like another, another level. level. Mm. In London, we were, I was very lucky to go to London because it was an exceptional Games. Mm. Uh, but I remember in my event we had uh, Jessica in us, so she was like the poster girl for mm. the London Olympics, and she mm. was like everywhere around London. You'd see her around the Billboards. Yeah, yeah. well, I saw her in the in my event, you know. Yeah. And so walked out into the Olympic Stadium, and we're on the first day and the first session. So usually you wouldn't expect like a morning session to be full, but mm. partly because of, well, mainly Jessica Innes and mm. London really got behind these games and it was like 85,000 people, you walk out and it's like, yeah. wow, this is yeah. this is gonna happen, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> this is real. Yeah. So in that regard, it was just like this um, realization of my dream is gonna come true, but then it was like, I've got a hip tath on to do, you know, yeah, like yeah. Oh, I want to be, I want to perform mm. and I want to do my best, not just for myself, for my family and my friends, but also for New Zealand, you know, yeah, it's sure. a, to earn the fern is like a really special thing. Of course. Yeah. But the, one of the coolest moments for me at the Olympics was having my uh, brothers and my sister, now sister-in-laws and my mum in the stands. Mm. And I didn't know where they were in the, and all these people and so I put my blocks down you kind of get to do two two starts over the first hurdle and I'm walking back just about to like you know get ready for the starting starters orders mm. and I hear my older brother like yell out and they're literally like in line with the start line like go Sarah yeah. and it was just like this really cool moment which I'll never forget yeah, because bet. it was so special. Well, is it hard to, because you know, I can only imagine like you're training for literally your entire career to get to the Olympic Games and you finally get there and like you say, like some massive crowd there if you're in front of 85,000 people and then you sort of, I can understand that it would feel surreal. So is it hard to bring yourself 
back to the present yeah. to understand that you're, yeah. you're like you're actually in an event and you're trying to perform as best you can. Like, yeah. was it tricky for you, or was, did you, were you pretty like task oriented by that stage? I think to answer your question, yes, it mm. is difficult because uh, you can do all this sports psych and do all the <laughs> practicing and simulation but you can't practice 85,000 yeah, yeah, like, you know, exactly. and you can't practice that emotion that you feel mm. so hurdles for me because we got seven events so it was mm. kind of like hurdles I was in good shape mm. uh, but kind of got a little bit I would say floaty over the hurdles Right. so I ran alright but it was kind of like that was a quite a nice release to like get into the heptathlon sure yeah so then yeah. I had six more events to yeah. kind of be like, get on with it. Yeah, right. Do your best mm. and, and, and do it well. That's Execute. Probably, yeah, I suppose it's something like, well, you spoke about that when you, you were um, only doing triple jump before, mm. you know. Um, what's it like, you know, when you've got those, when you've got seven events to get through, what does your recovery look like during that time? Because I, I, I like, obviously you're, central nervous system is taking a bit of a hammering mm. because it's absolute max intensity for every single event. So um, how does it, how, how do you go about sort of trying to make sure like you're even keel yeah. through that time? Yeah, good question. And it's, and that's practice over time, mm. um, experience. Uh, and it's so in terms of recovery in the event, so the heptathlon's held over two days. Mm. The first day is... Uh, 100 meter hurdles, high jump, shot put, 200 meters, mm. long jump, javelin, and 800 meters is the mm. final day. So you can have minimum 30 minutes in between events. And so that, but generally at a major championship, you'd have two events and then you'd have a long gap and then you'd come back for an evening session. Okay. So in the Olympics, we started. I think around 10, 10.30. Mm. So that meant that we're up like 6 and I started warming up at like 8.30 right. for a call, for the first call, mm. then to go. So there's a warm-up track out the back. Yeah. Then you go through and then under the, under the stadium, there's another 150 metres of track. Mm. So then you do the event. The first event to the second event, generally you kind of roll. Mm. roll from one to the other but then managing your spikes and troughs I guess is is really critical mm. because you want to come down or come up if you've had a shocker <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know because it's actually <laughs> of course, you're yeah. managing this roller coaster sure, yeah. um so nutrition was obviously a massive part of that uh i I'm really lucky to be able to just sleep when I can, like a 10-minute mm. sleep or a 5-minute oh, sleep. Oh, you can just do it? It's fine. You wow. Because you've got to train yourself to do that. Right, yeah, yeah of course. Because it's really important. Yeah. Uh, so what happens at a major championship is that underneath the stadium would have a room for the multi-eventers. You'd have oh. the, just like a marae almost, like yeah, mattresses yeah, down, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you'd see people just sleeping or like nowadays – I would have compacts on or yeah, you know, yeah. things like that. Mm. That would help. Uh, but back back in 2012, that that wasn't as big as it is now, yeah, and yeah. no one really. But I know now, heptathletes and decathletes are, are using more um, stimulant, like electrical stim, to actually as a neural kind of leveler. suppressor and leveler. Right. Yeah, yeah, leveler. Uh, and then. Uh, Treatment if things were tight, mm. uh, you would get some treatment if you if you had that available to you. Mm. Um, but the big thing is like if you, you finish late at night on the first day, sort of like you'd run at like nine thirty at night, mm. and then you'd be up again for like a ten a.m. event very quickly mm. in the morning. And by the time you get to bed you probably it's midnight by the time you get to the village yeah. and you've had an ice bath you've had um, a massage you've had something to eat you've gone gone back so that that's a critical piece there sure. so leading into a heptathlon banking sleep for me was always really critical mm. and I'm like 
love like a nine or ten hour. Yeah. Now I have children. That's obviously <laughs> shifted. Yeah, happy with four. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> So I think it's like a combination of factors. I also took a lot of supplements mm. uh, and there is like, there's one like neuron and you're off, which is like you can like take to start your day and then kind of manipulate through the day. Yeah. Um, also just general like um, the way you would eat in terms of an anti-inflammatory type focus mm. um, was really critical. Uh, but we did lots of things which was second nature to us and sure. I, s things that I still do today yeah. uh, to maximize recovery uh, and recover as fast as possible. But yeah. some t the hardest thing I think sometimes is when you have a really good performance, say in high jump, is uh, then being, so in high jump, if you clear a bar, that's your personal best, is then using that adrenaline to go another bar higher yeah um because i think when i finished heptathlon and went on specifically to high jump mm. just single event that was something which i could have done better right yeah okay. in those moments where i was you know attempting new zealand a new zealand record uh when i'd come off like a really good jump managing that spike is really critical yeah right yeah Okay, like I was just I was just thinking about it when you were talking just now, but talking about those sort of peaks and troughs that you go through. What is it like when you? Obviously, you just spoke about how you, if you do really well, you can get that sort of adrenaline rush, and then you're leading into the next event. What's it like when you have a poor event and you've still got? Like I assume if you're not super strong mentally. And I know you would have had so much more experience about it, with it, but I feel like if I was doing this, something like this, right, and I'm in my first event and I do poorly, and then I'm like, fucking hell, I've got six more events and I've already wrecked it. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, it, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Okay, so in my last heptathlon in 2008, uh, I'm giving you the exact example that you've described. Yep. Uh, this is the last chance to qualify for Beijing, and I was probably not ready for Beijing, mm -hmm. but... It was in a uh, heptathlon in Germany, and I was looking like a, I was leading the hurdles race, and I hit the second to last hurdle and smash on the ground. Oh, no. So exactly that, mm. and I was just like distraught because mm. I was like, oh gosh, this is not good. Mm. And you just have to pick yourself up, and I think you develop a lot of resilience in this game yeah I uh, and it's it's kind of like that s lots of times when I did that uh, and I did seven heptathlons where I did like three no throws or mm. so that's terrible mm. because like that's all around the world I travel to like and I essentially did like a I like in rugby it would be like I don't know what it'd be like in rugby, actually. I haven't thought about that example. <laughs> it's a dumb one. Um, like not, I was going to say not coming for the second half, yeah, but yeah, right. you could do really well in the first half yeah. still and still win the game. Right, right. But actually, it's like the whole team not coming for the second half. So yeah. it's a rampant. Like, mm. there's no point in you playing. Mm. But at the same time, it's kind of like I was told very the first time uh, in what would have been 2002 when you start a heptathlon, you finish it. Mm. And I think that start to finish focus is something that I've had sure. um, probably all my life, mm. but it's like, actually, you are to yourself. Mm. And regardless of how shit you feel in that moment, you finish it. Yeah. You finish it. Sure. And there's been times where I haven't like been on track for a personal best, and I remember being in the UK one time and um, being like, oh, I'm not going to run the 800. Like, I'm just <laughs> so over this. Mm. And that was probably like, very bad side of where I was at that time. Mm. But I was like lying on the high jump mats going, oh, I just can't be effed running this, putting myself through more hurt and disappointment. And then literally 10 minutes before the race, I was like, I can't do it. I, I have to finish this. Mm. And you build this resilience and I guess mental toughness in those moments. Mm. But 
sometimes you have your disappointment in the moment, you park it, move on, and then you finish the heptathlon and then you deal with the whole sure. after because yeah. it's kind of like managing those peaks. Yeah. And when you have a really um, tough time in a heptathlon, you've got to, you got to move on quickly. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. otherwise you'll have, you won't just have one bad event, mm. you'll have seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and that's a very, very long two days. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's, um, it sounds so tough, but obviously um, something that probably transfers to the rest of your life now, I guess, Absolutely. having that resilience. You know? Absolutely. It's yeah. kind of like the pressure I have applied to myself in those moments to perform, mm. uh, I know that whatever life throws at me, I'll find a way to cope. Yeah. No matter yeah. how shit it is. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that uh, those strategies or personal tactics that you apply in those moments when you're really tested, mm. uh, they absolutely transform. Mm. And I think this is a real power of sport to teach kids, to teach uh adults to teach people that success isn't like this mm. you know it's like this 100 yeah, yeah. yeah and that's life yeah yeah and so it's like sport is just such a great metaphor for preparing yeah. us for these inevitable challenges that we will face in life mm. yeah no, i 100 agree um okay so let's fast forward a little bit to the 2014 um glasgow uh Com games how come you went to just high jump there so I was I was tired mm. of heptathlon, right. I think, and I knew I wanted to go to another Com Games, uh, and I really wanted to medal, mm. uh, but I wasn't like I was like oh I'm not really sure about heptathlon, and at the time heptathlon was really strong in the Commonwealth. Right, right. So I uh, had a little holiday after the Olympics and was like, okay. Um, like, you should really have a holiday from sport. But I was like, right, next plan. Yeah. Um, I And it came down to I could transfer to sevens, sure. try for sevens, yeah. or do athletics but maybe just do high jump because mm. at that stage I jumped 191, mm. which was good, mm. uh, and which was good enough to go as an individual. Mm. Or I could play netball. So I actually trialed for the Magic Netball team. Yeah. So I had a month where I was like, right, I'm gonna really, I'm gonna try and make netball, I give it a go. Mm. So trained for like a month, six weeks, and um, trialed for the Magic, and actually got into the Mystics wider training group. I got into the Magic wider training group as well, but I was living in Auckland, so went with mm. the Mystics. But I thought I could still do high jump with netball. Yeah. Um, but actually, I couldn't. Mm. It was totally different energy system, sure, and yeah. I, I just couldn't give everything to one without the other one dropping. So I had to make a choice, mm. and so in the end, I chose high jump, and it was a really good challenge to just do one. It yeah. was a lot harder than I expected to mm. do one, mm. uh, but I'm I was really glad to go to Glasgow and mm. high jump. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Hey, with high jump, how is your, how do you um, how does it go with your tendons and joints and stuff? Because it it's just I, I just I don't know. Obviously, <laughs> I'm a bit bigger person, so <laughs> I probably struggle with getting getting off the ground. But I I feel like um, it's just so much stress through, especially like that the one side and like again having to deal with that curve and then that super explosive like bounce um did you ever have issues outside of your feet like um with your joints and tendons when it comes to high jump yeah absolutely yeah, yeah right it's brutal yeah and it's like the same direction so yeah. like when i was doing high jump as a heptathlete you you kind of have this uh a bit more balance of rhythms because mm you're using different planes, you're rotating, you're, I actually high jumped off my left foot, took off off my left foot, but then I long jumped off my right foot. Okay. So I sort of had a little bit, you know, mm. and then I- Balances it out Yeah, balances out a little bit. Yeah. But that was my, definitely my Achilles, both sides, 
took a took a hammering. Mm. Uh, patella tendon hammering. Uh, I got a disc bulge in my thoracic spine. Mm. Um, it's yeah. So yeah, it's like elite sport. You walk, walk a fine line. Yeah, and, yeah. and you fall over sometimes. Yeah, but high jump is actually really hard. So your power to weight is really critical. So sure. part of my transition was like I had to change my body shape as well. So yeah, yeah that was a yeah. good challenge as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, okay, and these days you're still competing in triple jump, is that right? I am. So, yeah, so, so <laughs> tell me how uh, that's come about. Well, I in 2000, and, so I did retire mm. in 2014. I feel like I retired from international competition. And, uh, okay. well, but now I'm going to say this, I'm going to totally contradict that. Because, <laughs> <laughs> so, so in 2017, World Masters were in New Zealand. Yeah. And some friends <laughs> of mine were like, so Chantal Brunner, who's still the long New Zealand record long jump um, record holder, yeah. and Jane Arnott, who... I was on, they were both on teams with me and my friends and um, athletes who I really looked up to growing up. Mm. Uh, and some other friends uh, were putting together a relay team. Right. And I was like, oh, that would be quite cool. I'd be keen for that. Yeah. And so it was four by 100 meters. So I was like, I can run 100 meters. So yeah. Like had my, had Max, my son, who's now five. Mm. And I was like, it would be a great goal to train for something. Mm. Anyway, I was like, entered and it was $300 to like run a hundred meters. I'm like, Oh man, I really should do another event. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and I always liked triple jump when I, I liked the thought of it cause I like plyometric training. Sure. I love bounding. I could bound for days. Mm. Uh, so I was like, maybe I'll just do another event. So I never had done triple jump and I mm. did it at world masters. I really enjoyed it and was that season like, the highest ranked Kiwi in triple jump. Right. So I was like, oh, that would be cool. Anyway, I had, had my daughter, mm. we had Poppy and kind of needed a goal to like, just cause it need a goal. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. so I came back to it last year for last season mm. and finished second in the nationals last year yeah. and it was really cool but i sort of felt like i could do more <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so i did this year and yeah we had nationals a couple of weeks ago and i got third and yeah it was Amazing. yeah so but i was i had really bad sacroiliac issues oh, from okay. about december through till february so mm. It's probably not the best thing to be doing, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> so, yeah. Tell, what's your plans with it uh, moving forward? Then I have no idea. No, no, no. I have no idea. So, is is it just something that gives you like a bit of focus? I guess having yeah. competitions and yeah. stuff coming up. Yeah. yeah. Right. So for me, I know I need to exercise. Mm. Uh, I'm a better person for exercise, mm. and I also know I'm like a goal focused person. Sure. So. Uh, so that's part of it. Mm. And the other part of it is I, I want to show my children that actually you can still do things when you're older mm -hmm. and a mum. Yeah. And also I want to show other people that, you know, it's it's okay to want to actually still be competitive, mm. still uh, feel like you can do more. And if you can't, then that's fine. Of course, yeah. uh, but I think it's it's important for me to be uh, having something to, to strive for, even though I don't have a goal right now for yeah, it yeah. because it's too fresh for me. Yeah. Uh, but I will figure that out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Sarah, what do you do for um, Mahi these days? What are, you, what are you involved in now? So I'm the chair of the Athletes Commission for the That's New Zealand right. Olympic Committee. Yeah. And... As the chair, I sit on the board of the New Zealand Olympic Committee. So yeah. really involved in the Olympic and Commonwealth movements mm. in New Zealand uh, in, a, in a governance mm. role and really lucky to be part of an awesome team, not only our athlete commission, yeah. uh, really trying to provide an athlete voice, not mm. only within the NZOC, but external as sure. well, when, when, when the opportunity arises. Yeah, yeah. Um, but 
yeah, so I have that role and I'm also a board member of University Tertiary Sport New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And in terms of mahi as well, I work for Newsroom as a columnist for Locker Room. Yeah, right. Which is a dedicated uh, site profiling women and girls in sport. Yeah, right. So I that's, looked, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Very cool, I yeah. love it. I'll, I'll chuck a link down in the description, ah, um, guys, into the show yeah, notes so you can, yeah, <laughs> so you can check cool. that out. It's um, it's some, there's some really cool um, articles and stuff on there, actually. Yeah, I really enjoy it because it's like I love people and I love people who are passionate about things, they're cool. going after things, and also, uh, obviously, as an advocate for women and girls in sport, uh, when women and girls see these people doing things, then it all of a sudden becomes possible for them too. For sure, for mm. sure. Oh, what a perfect ambassador for that, mate. That's that's really cool stuff. Uh, so what are your, I know obviously you're very goals focused. What, what's your goals for um, the rest of 2021 and moving forward? Not necessarily in the athletic sort of realm, but um, just in general. So our for our family, we my son started school in February. Mm -hmm. So for us, settling Max into school, and also uh, Poppy's going to start a forest school daycare okay. uh, on our road, which is really cool. So our kids, that's been really a, a focus for us. Yeah. Uh, my husband works for High Performance Sport New Zealand, yeah. so has lots of athletes who are preparing for Tokyo. Mm. Uh, so. That's also part of our family, I guess, as well, mm. uh, because there are a lot of the, the athletes he works with are, are, are our friends, yeah. uh, my friends. So, yeah. uh, but for me personally, it's more about now that the athletic season has finished, uh, a lot of work around the Olympics. Mm. Uh, I'm also an Olympic ambassador, so mm. I go into schools and talk about my journey and the Olympic values and mm -hmm. how that sort of lines up. So hopefully. Uh, do some more visits, particularly in the lead up to Tokyo. Sure. Um, but we just really want to enjoy this time as a family. We, we, you you never get the time back with your kids. Yeah. And so that's really special for us. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think we can all relate to that, mate. Um, that's a really cool story. And I, I just want to uh, say very grateful for your time and thanks for making the trip across to to have a chat with us and i think yours is a really inspiring story and you've got some really cool take homes for the audience to check out so um thank you very much for coming and uh having a yarn with us thank you it's been awesome thanks guys uh we'll see you guys in the next podcast cheers